to um, present um, Horace Roman tonight. He is uh, a very well-known uh, endometriosis surgeon from Bordeaux, France. Um, I think everybody knows him and tonight he's going to talk about tips and tricks in surgical management of deep endo of the rectum. Um, Horace Roman is um, a professor, a honorary professor at the Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark and uh, he's a member of our uh, executive board of the Endometriosis League and also member of the executive board of the World Endo Society. Um, I think uh, we are going to learn a lot of tips and tricks tonight. I'm very happy uh, to have uh, Horace Roman here tonight. Um, before we start, I would like to make uh, an announcement on uh, the uh, masterclass, the European Endometriosis Masterclass that we would like to start in 2021. And um, to begin next year, we have six uh, sites in six countries all over Europe and registration is open now uh, on our website um, euroendometriosis.com so you can find their uh, masterclass in january in duisburg germany in february in bordeaux france with horace roman um, in march uh, bucharest romania um, april budapest in hungary in september in london in england and also in September in Bern in Switzerland. So if you have any questions, uh, just let us know. And uh, now I am happy to present you Horace Roman. Horace, we are interested in your presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Harald. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be involved in uh, in this webinar and to have the opportunity to speak about one of my um, favorite topics, which is the management of uh, uh, deep endometriosis infiltrating the rectum using the disc excision. And I will focus today the disc excision using a circular stapler because I think it is the most uh, affordable for uh, any endometriosis surgeon in the world. So, First, I will present you my, uh, uh, my conflict of interest because uh, I was involved in uh, master classes and workshops organized by Plasma Surgical Olympus, Nordic Pharma and Ethicon. And I was paid for this, but in this master classes, I tried to share my experience uh, in, the, in, in the management of uh, deep endometriosis. <clears throat> so to start, you know that usually we find we may find two types uh, of rectosigmoid nodules of deep endometriosis infiltrating the rectosigmoid. The most frequent type is uh, uh, related to a kind of, of nodule which infiltrates the mid or the upper rectum, but also the isthmus of the uterus and the vagina. So this nodule are uh, easy to find at the clinical examination because they usually infiltrate the vagina or maybe felt using the, the vaginal, uh, using the finger. And also they uh, can be seen easily at the ultrasound or MRI. And uh, the second type, or what I call solitary nodules of the sigmoid, meaning that they may not be connected to any other structures, maybe with the left, uh, with the left ovary, but it's, it's <clears throat> not so frequent. So they are nodules uh, with an evolution into the, into the lumen of the, of the sigmoid. So they may be overlooked by radiologists, but also by the, by the surgeons, because they are, they, are, they are located on the mobile part of the sigmoid and they may, uh, may uh, lead to occlusions. But this kind of nodule usually cannot be removed by disc excision because they are too large. So in my presentation, I will focus on the first type of, of, uh, of nodules, the posterior adenomyoma involving the upper rectum and the mid rectum because they are suitable 
for discic excision. Now let's see what is the place of the disc excision in the management of rectal endometriosis. And I can answer these questions because five years ago, I carried out a survey in France. I call this the France study, where I asked to all the surgeons involved in the management of deep endometriosis to count, to record, all the patients managed for colorectal endometriosis during one year in 2015. So this survey uh, involved uh, 56 facilities in France, and um, we recorded 1,135 women managed by colorectal endometriosis. And it was interesting to see, and very satisfactory to see, that 90% of them had a minimally invasive approach. And more than a half of them, they, have, and they had conservative procedures meaning shaving or disc excision. But the number of disc excision was quite low because they represented only 7%, 7% of all the patients managed for correct endometriosis. And the large majority of them were here in my unit in Rouen at this time. So if you remove the patients managed by me in Rouen, you will see that the disc excision is only incidentally performed in France in 2015. And this is a pity because in my own experience, the disc excision is carried out in almost 30% of patients. So here you have my database from January 2005 when I started performing deep endometriosis of the rectum until the lockdown in March 2020. So there were 1,060 patients managed for correct endometriosis, and one third of them had disc excision, 35% of them had shaving, and 40% um, and, uh, uh, of them had colorectal resection. So 60% of patients had conservative procedures, shaving of disc excision, 30% were suitable for disc excision. So I think that the disc excision may be done or is suitable in 30% of cases. But to carry out a disc excision using the circular stapler, you should be at ease with the shaving. So the shaving is a individualized procedure of treatment of colorectal endometriosis. It means that the surgeon tries to excise the nodule without opening the rectum. He can use, to do this, he can use the scissors, laser, plasma, hammer, scalpel, uh, robot. The goal is to excise as completely as possible without opening the rectum, so with a bowel conservation. However, in my opinion, the shaving, when it is done alone, should not be should not be pushed too into the depth in order to avoid a delayed necrosis of the shaved area. So um, uh, if there is an injury of the, of the rectum, so many colleagues used to put stitches, me, I convert to disc excision. The shaving, when you perform only shaving, um, I, I have done it in 30, 35% of cases. Um, when you perform the shaving, you have a low rate of complications and you do not risk to impair the digestive complaints of patients. So the patients uh, were ne or never worse after your surgery than before. However, it, it seems that the risk of recurrences is higher because uh, the excision in the majority of cases is not complete. That's why in my experience, I reserve the shaving to elderly women who may have a postoperative amenorrhea until the menopause in order to reduce the risk of recurrences. But I also perform the shaving as the first step of the disc excision because the disc excision means that you remove not only the nodule, but you remove also the, the, the wall involved by the nodule, meaning you, you remove a patch of the bowel 
and then you have to suture the bowel. The suture can be done directly by stitches, by transurnal stapler, this is the topic of this evening, or you can use for a low rectal nodule the semicircular stapler, the so called the Rouen technique I introduced in 2009 in Rouen. The goal of the disc excision is a more complete excision than that provided by the shaving, but also the bowel conservation because you will take only a patch of the anterior rectal wall and you will conservate the overall volume of the rectum and also the mesorectum and the vascularization and the innervation of the rectum. So <clears throat> you have to know that when you perform a disc excision, maybe, maybe you're not micros microscopically complete in 30 to 40 percent of cases because me and Valentino Remorgida or over colleagues who perform the, the disc excision usually ask to the pathologist to check uh, whether or not they are foci on the limit of the disc excision because it means that maybe the foci are also around the disc excision. So microscopic foci may be found on the limit of the disc excision in 30 to 40 percent of cases. But this disadvantage when compared to the colorectal resection is counterbalanced, in my opinion, by the preservation of the mesorectum, the lack of the stenosis, so a suture in this excision is not circular, so there is no stenosis after this suture, and uh, also a good functional outcomes. So this is my personal experience in disc excision. So to date, I have, uh, I have carried out in 317 patients. And in two thirds of cases, I use the circular stapler. And in one third of cases, I use the Rouen technique with a semicircular stapler, which is not the, the object of the presentation today. But please pay attention to the recurrences rate which is actually very low because only four cases out of 317 presented to have recurrences on the rectum. And none of them had a stenosis of the bowel. So this is a major point, the lack of the stenosis after the disc excision. And of course, the disc excision is the alternative to the colorectal segmental resection. And as you can see, you, you saw in the, in the previous slide, I routinely do the colorectal resection too in 40% uh, of cases. But I reserve the colorectal resection to only patients who are not longer suitable for the disc excision or for the shaving, meaning the patients who had subocclusive nodule, huge subocclusive, subocclusive nodule, or not you're responsible for long bowel infiltration, which is impossible to remove as a disc, or in nodule responsible for a circumferential infiltration of the bowel, or in multifocal nodules, which are very close each other. And this is not indicated to perform disc excision too close in order to avoid that the the short segment of the rectum below, uh, between two sutures may, uh, uh, may, have a, may, a, may undergo a necrosis. You have to know that if you perform a, uh, serial sections by the pathologist, you may also find, uh, um, find microscopic foci far from the nodule after this, after colorectal resection. So I think that the colorectal resection is not microscopically complete in 10 to 30 percent of cases. But the recurrences rate is very low with colorectal resection is incidental, 1 percent. However, when compared to the disc excision, there is a significant risk of uh, stenosis of the anastomosis, meaning that the, steno that the anastomosis you leave becomes very, very narrow and require endoscopic dilations or even 
secondary uh, segmental resection, and it may happen in 8 to 10 percent of cases. When you have two rectal nodules, a rectal nodule or a sigmoid colon nodule, um, you may perform a disc excision on the rectum and a short segmental resection on the, on the sigmoid, meaning that here you have a, a type 1 rectal nodule and here you have a type 2 nodule. And this combined disc excision and segmental resection uh, allows to spare, to conservate a long, uh, healthy rectal uh, bowel segment. And I think it is, uh, it should be considered in patients where the on block colorectal resection would be too low in order to avoid uh, unfavorable functional outcomes. So the disc excision is very useful in these cases to treat the lower nodule. Now, how I do the disc excision using a circular step, right? I told you that I perform it in one third of cases. So there are two steps of this procedure. The first one is to perform the deep shaving in order to remove 80% of the nodule and to leave on the rectal wall only a thin part of fibrous tissue. Then the second step is the uh, removal of the disc itself using a circular stapler. The shaved area is between the anvil and the shoulder, and it is removed like a calzone, where here you have the staple. So you have the staples, here you have the staple, and if you open your calzone, you have a pizza, which is here the rectal patch with the shaved area. Here you have this black, this is the shaved area. So you perform the shaving, and you remove the shaved area like a calzone, like this. And behind you have a rectal suture. So I individualized 10 steps to perform the disc excision using the circular stapler. The first, just imagine that you have a type 1 rectal nodule involving the vagina, the isthmus, the uterosacral ligaments, and the rectum. The first step is to cut the nodule in two parts. One is left on the vagina and will be removed after. And the second one is on the rectum. Then the rectal shaving will remove 80% of the fragment left on the rectum in order to render, to, to, to have a thin rectal wall, which is fibrous because it is infiltrated, but it is thin and it is soft. Then you have to remove the fat tissue on the lateral rectal wall in order to avoid to catch it into the stapled line. So we remove the fat tissue. And then you will put a stitch on the superior and to the inferior limit of the shaved area. Then you will introduce the circular stapler closed. So this is the end, this is the shoulder, the stapler is closed is introduced at the level of the nodule. Then it is open with the anvil proximally and the shoulder distally from the shaved area. Then the nodule, the knot is performed and the shaved area will be pushed into the lumen of the rectum. Then the gynecology surgeon will pull on the, we'll pull down on the thread in order to push the shaved area into the circular stapler and the colorectal surgeon, the general surgeon, which is placed between the legs of the patient, will close the stapler on the shaved area. Then the stapler will be fired, the calzone will be removed. Here you have the stapled line, which can be reinforced with some stitches. And at the end, we will perform a bubble test, inflating air into the rectum and by covering the rectum with uh, water in laparoscopy. So now I will show you these steps in a five minutes movie. You can find this movie on the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynecology site.
it is destined to deep endometriosis nodules infiltrating the rectum on three to four centimeter length. This is the nodule. The first step results in nodule dissection and rectum releasing. Deep pararectal spaces are opened and the nodule is sectioned in two fragments, the anterior one infiltrating the vagina and the uterosacral ligaments and the posterior one infiltrating the rectum. The dissection is directed toward the healthy rectovaginal space located below the rectum. At the end of the step, the rectovaginal space should be widely opened while the rectum is still notably infiltrated by the fibrous nodule on the anterior and lateral wall. The second step is mandatory and it is represented by the rectal shaving. The rectal shaving is performed as deeply as possible into the thickness of the rectal wall in order to remove abnormal fibrous tissue involving rectal layers using a high magnification endoscopic view. As the transanal circular stapler cannot remove more than 7 cm cube of tissue, it results that the thinner and softer the shaved rectal wall, the greater the diameter of rectal patch that can be removed using the transcendental stapler. This step can be performed using plasma energy, laser, scissors, harmonic scalpel, or other devices. During the first step, the surgeon should remove the fat tissue located on the lateral wall of the rectum. The goal is to avoid the presence of the fat tissue in the stapled line, which may result in fistula or rectal age. The fourth step is the placement of the suture on shaved area. The surgeon places a stitch on the inferior limit of the shaved area, then a second one on the superior limit. We use a vicryl 30 extremities of the thread or pulled out through the suprapubic trocker, but the knot should not be done at that moment. The suture is maintained under tension. During the fifth step, the circular stapler is introduced, closed, transanally. It should be lubricated, then gently pushed through the anus. We usually employ transcendental circular stapler of 31 or 33 millimeter diameter. The stapler is gently pushed until the inferior limit of the shaved area. During the sixth step, the stapler is opened at the nodules level until the advil can be seen two or three centimeters above the superior limit of the shaved area. The shoulder is maintained one centimeter below the inferior limit of the shaved area. During the seventh step, the laparoscopy surgeon, which results in pushing the shaved area inside the lumen, inferior and superior limits of the shaved area are now on contact while the shaved area cannot longer be seen by the laparoscopist because it is into the lumen of the rectum. The thread is cut four to five centimeters far from the knot. During the eighth step, the colorectal surgeon placed between the legs of the patient, antiverses, and progressively closes the transanal stapler while the laparoscopy surgeon pushes the knot into the lumen between the anvil and the shoulder of the transcendental stapler. Antiversion of the stapler is mandatory in order to avoid catching the posterior rectal wall into the stapler. The stapler is closed, fired, then progressively removed under the laparoscopic control. Once the transcendental stapler was removed outside the rectum, the colorectal searcher opens the stapler to remove the specimen. During the ninth step, reinforcement sutures along the stapler line may be placed as deemed necessary. To do this, 
we use a Resol Bubble for zero stitches. The suture should involve the full thickness of both superior and inferior edges. At the end of the procedure, the stepper line should be well vascularized and the fluorescein test may be helpful during the last step to ensure the integrity of the stepper line. An air test is performed by flooding the pelvis cavity with warm saline solution and inflating the rectum with air. It is destined to... Well, <clears throat> now what about the large rectal nodule? Because this, uh, this technique presented in the movie is suitable for nodule up to three to four centimeter in length. Because as I told you in the movie, the circular stepper cannot catch inside more than seven centimeter cube of tissue, which is quite small. So when the nodule or larger, you can perform either the Rouen technique using the semicircular stepper with the condition to have a nodule of the low rectal, uh, low rectum. And in this case, the patch may be as large as six or seven centimeter in diameter. Or you can perform a double disc excision, meaning that if at the end of the disc excision performed as it has been shown in the movie. If you think that there are some residual endometriosis on the edges, the edges can be removed with a second uh, circular stapler um, of 29 millimeter diameter. And this is the double disc excision. So we recently uh, reported a case area in a GMEG uh, job. Now the question is, okay, we will remove a patch of the rectal wall, but it means that the rectal wall will be shorter. What happens with the posterior rectal wall? So, of course, we have an excess of the length of the posterior rectal wall. However, this, uh, this uh, feature, this shape of the rectum is not related to impaired um, digestive function in our experience. And if you think that when you perform a colorectal resection with side to end anastomosis, you still have a pouch like this laterally, um, it means that uh, this, this pouch is uh, unavoidable, but probably it is not related to an impairment of the rectal function. Now, what about the immediate complications? You have to know that if you perform the disc, disc excision, the region is maybe not that to decrease the immediate complications rate. Because the disc excision means performing a rectal suture and the rectal suture may be related to uh, complications. So here you have uh, our series in Rouen until 2015, where we compare the complications related to shaving disc excision and segmental colorectal resection. And you can see that uh, the fistula and uh, the clavian fibri complications are significantly higher uh, using disc excision when compared to shaving and maybe a bit less than uh, those observed with uh, segmental corrector resection. So you have complications if you perform the disc excision. And this is one of our last papers published in open access, so you can read it in human reproduction, where we put together 1,102 patients undergoing uh, surgery for colorectal endometriosis in order to understand uh, the risk factor for fistula and also how we manage the fistula uh, later. And we observed that uh, we had a uh, fistula rate of 3.4 percent. Uh, three, two thirds of them were rectovaginal fistula, one third were uh, leakages. But you can see that the risk of uh, rectovaginal fistula when compared to shaving is quite similar between the disc excision and segmental resection, meaning that they 
performing a disc excision or segmental resection increases the risk of fistula uh, five to six fold when compared to shaving. And when you perform a combined rectal disc excision with sigmoid colon resection, the risk of fistula is cumulated between the two procedures and you increase the risk eightfold, uh, 11 fold when compared to the shaving. So the conclusion is that if you perform a disc excision instead of a segmental resection, probably is not to reduce the risk of bowel fistula. In my opinion, the reason to carry out a disc excision instead of colorectal resection is to improve the functional outcomes. So the functional outcomes means the rectal function itself. So you perform a rectal surgery, it is logical to have a look at, to have a look at the rectal function after the surgery. Problem, the problem is that the rectal function is the very complex situation and which is multifactorial because it depends on the rectal shape. And here, the type of surgical procedure may uh, play a role, but also the rectal innervation, the possibility to carry out a nerve sparing technique, but also some hidden preoperative functional troubles such as the chronic constipation, functional constipation or irritable bowel syndrome. It is well known that when a surgeon performs a segmental resection on the mid or low rectum, there is a risk, well known risk of LARS, low anterior rectal resection syndrome, which is a mixture of constipation, anal incontinence, frequent bowel movements, and several dyskesia and several troubles, major troubles of uh, the rectal function. And <clears throat> the LARS may be related to the rectal denervation, to the rectosigmoid stenosis, to a reduction of rectal reservoir when the low uh, colorectal resection is performed, and also to the risk of fecal incontinence and urgency. And in this case, in this case, uh, the disc excision may be helpful because the rectal denervation is usually done to inadvertent section of splattening nerves in large nodule of parametria. The rect rectosigmoid stenosis uh, concern may be 10% of colorectal anastomosis and 0% of disc excisions. The reduction of rectal reservoir is related to the removal of the segment of the rectum, while performing a disc excision maybe does not impact too much the, the volume uh, of the rectum, even though the shape is modified by the posterior pouch. And the risk for fecal incontinence urgency is related to long colorectal resection, where the colon is get down, is got down, getting down to the, to the low rectum and the high intracolic pressure um, impacts directly on the anal sphincter. So when a colorectal resection is performed, the LARS may be frequent. It may be up to 40% of cases in the Syria of Aarhus Hospital in Denmark, where the surgeons are very, very skilled in uh, colorectal endometriosis. So <clears throat> for years, I was convinced that uh, the disc excision and the shaving may reduce the risk <clears throat> of uh, bowel troubles, postoperative bowel troubles. And at the point that I carried out a randomized trial to compare, to demonstrate that the conservative surgery is better related to better functional outcomes <clears throat> than the colorectal resection. And I was excessively disappointed when I saw that the results were not as different as expected. Because in 60 patients randomized between conservative surgery and radical approaches, the functional outcomes were similar, except it may be for the anal continence. 
and I could only show that there is a significant risk of bowel stenosis <clears throat> after colorectal resection. However, however, in this, the, 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 the randomized trial could be jeopardized by the inclusion criteria because I enrolled patients with rectal lesions, rectal nodules, and um, I considered that the rectum is up to 15 centimeter high uh, from the annulus. And maybe the enrollment of many patients with upper rectal nodule improves the um, functional outcomes in the arm of uh, colorectal resection. So maybe the, the trial should be repeated in only patients with low colorectal nodules where maybe the disc excision is, uh, uh, may provide better functional outcomes. However, anyway, this randomized trial uh, proved that the surgery of colorectal endometriosis is a very efficient tool to improve patient's health. Because five years after the follow-up, there were only one recurrence in 60 patients, and there was a constant improvement in pain, gastrointestinal score, quality of life, a very high rate of pregnancy, postoperative pregnancy rate 80%, and even 75% in infertile women who had surgery for rectal endometriosis, and a majority of pregnancies were natural. So the randomized trial was uh, useful to prove this, uh, these major outcomes. <clears throat> but I told, that, I told you that I think that if you repeat the randomized trial and we enroll only patients with low rectal nodule up to eight centimeter high, the results might be different with a more favorable outcomes in patients with disc excision of the rectum. And here you have a very recent study, which is in review in uh, diseases colon rectum, where I enrolled only patients with low rectal nodule. Uh, all of them were managed in uh, Huo. And uh, we observed that uh, the items of the large score were better, some of items were better in, the, uh, in patients with disc excision as well the percentage of patients without class, so with normal bowel movements, were 61% in the rectal disc excision group versus 43% in the colorectal resection group. So I think that in, in low nodule, uh, you have to try to carry out a disc excision anytime you can. So people who routinely perform only colorectal resection usually affirm that, say that they do this in order to reduce the risk of recurrences because the disc excision and the, and the shaving will leave microscopic foci behind. So I studied all this uh, problem in patients with shaving and I agree that the majority of them may have uh, microscopic foci on the rectal wall. However, I still perform shaving in 30% of patients. I also observed that in up to 40% of patients, there are all microscopic foci on the limits of the disc. So maybe the disc excision is not microscopically complete in 30, in 30 to 40% of cases. However, the rate of recurrence is very low, 1.5%. But also, in patients with colorectal resection, if the pathologist performs serial sections, he may find microscopic foci very far from the nodule. Meaning that if you perform short colorectal resection, particularly on the mid rectum, you may leave this nodule behind. So even the colorectal resection is not a microscopically complete procedure. So the, in my opinion, the microscopic complete removal of endometriosis foci is not a realistic goal of the deep endometriosis surgery. So in conclusion, I think that the surgery of colorectal endometriosis is a new specialty. 
which is challenging, is complex, maybe more complex than that of gynecological cancer. The minimal invasive approach is feasible in more than 90% of cases because during the last two years in Bordeaux, I have managed about 400 colorectal endometriosis and I opened the abdomen in only one case. So the rate of open surgery is 0.25% of cases. You have to keep in mind when you perform a colorectal surgery that your patient is young and she will live 50 to 60 years after your surgery. So the quality of life after your surgery is determinant for her overall quality of life. The disc excision using the circular staple is suitable, it's feasible, it's affordable for any surgeon skilled, more or less skilled in colorectal endometriosis. And it is feasible on 33% of cases. One third of patients may be treated by disc excision. The immediate complications risk of disc excision is not too far from that of colorectal resection. So if you perform disc excision, you may expect severe complications rate, immediate complications rate. However, the functional outcomes may be better after disc excision when it concerns the lower rectum. And I think that a balance used of techniques, shaving, disc excision, and colorectal resection is a hallmark of a so for skilled colorectal surgeon with an individualized, individualized a custom-made management and approach to his patients. And if you wish to see more uh, procedures, there are hundreds, several hundred procedures of these decisions on my uh, YouTube channel, on the LinkedIn channel. And don't remember, uh, European Endometriosis League organizes a masterclass, European masterclass in February 2021 in Bordeaux. The first one was scheduled one day after the lockdown in, uh, in uh, Bordeaux, so it was, uh, it was canceled one day after the lockdown. And also you're all invited in December 2021 to the sixth European Endometriosis Congress in Bordeaux. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. Thank you, Horace. <clears throat> thank you for your excellent presentation. It's really brilliant. Um, you have so many cases, such a huge experience and um, it's very, very good to see um, how you handle these patients and that you remind us uh, of how careful we should be uh, with these surgeries and our patients. Um, there are many questions uh, in the chat and um, I invite you all to write your questions to the chat so I can um, ask them to Horace. And, um, I might start with a question or us regarding the interdisciplinarity. You mentioned the general surgeon, the visceral surgeon. Um, maybe you can uh, point out um, how you uh, handle this interdisciplinary pr problem, or maybe it's not a problem, in your center, which is highly specialized, and how uh, people should do it in their hospital or their uh, clinic. So first of all, you have to know that in uh, France, uh, the law asks that the, colorect, the suture on the rectum should be done by a general surgeon because all the lawyers and the attorneys will consider that the, the suture of the rectum is better done by a guy trained in, uh, in uh, general surgery than by a gynecologist. <coughs> I have always had a colorectal surgeon with uh, me for the, specifically for the time of the rectal suture. So for years in, uh, in uh, Rouen, the colorectal surgeon was spending maybe one half an hour, 45 minutes with me for all the procedure on the rectum. And then 
with the experience, I uh, have started uh, performing the resection and I call him only for the suture. So it is very important to have a colorectal surgeon with you because you're not alone. Because if you perform a lot of cases like this, you will have an expected high rate of frequent cases with complications because in Bordeaux, you are two gynecology surgeons and two colorectal surgeons, so we are working together. And we are managing uh, eight to 10 colorectal endometriosis a week. It means that every month, we reasonably expect to have one fistula. So this management of the fistula, to manage a fistula, you have to be uh, very quick and uh, your, the management should be very fast. And it is over the possibilities of only one guy. So it is very, it, it is, for me, it is impossible to, to think that uh, uh, one guy will do all the colorectal surgery, then we'll go to Congress, he'll go on vacation, and uh, nobody uh, is in the hospital to manage the complications. And this, uh, so I think that having two colorectal surgeons, uh, two skilled colorectal surgeons is the minimal to, to build a, uh, a center with a good activity in, uh, in colorectal endometriosis. So the presence of the colorectal surgeon is mandatory for the suture, for me. Um, Horace, there are some questions regarding hormonal treatment before and after the surgery. What is your recommendation? Do you have a special um, recommendation before surgery and after surgery? So the medical treatment before the surgery in my opinion, is useful only to, to reduce the inflammation. So I think that the, the patients with a good medical treatment for several months before the surgery, uh, the surgery is very pleasant because the inflammation is reduced, because there is no excessive bleeding. However, in, in, in daily practice, uh, it, is not, it is not very easy to block, correctly block uh, the, the ovaries. And um, in, now in France, the patients do not longer wish to, to have uh, menopausis using the generate analogs. So I considerably reduced the percentage of women with preparation using uh, generate analogs. So I give them pills, but even, even with pills, now there is a, a kind of movement of, uh, of group of uh, of patients of women who do not longer accept to have hormonal treatment. So <clears throat> it happens now more and more that I perform the surgery ten days after the period. So it, it is less pleasant because uh, because there is mm, blood and inflammation, but it is feasible. But after the surgery, after the surgery, I think that the amenorrhea for one month may be useful because there is, a, there is a study demonstrating that performing the surgery of endometriosis and having the periods during the 10 days after the, the surgery would increase the risk of recurrences. Because we can imagine that when you perform the excision, uh, there is a healing of the excised zone and this healing uh, increased the participation of cytokine and growth factors and if you have uh, blood with some endometrial, endometrial cells you may expect that the cells will uh, uh, may grow on the excision so in my opinion i always ask to patients to try to take a pill uh, one to two <coughs> months after uh, after the surgery but it is less frequent that, that more and more patients do not longer accept this uh, hormonal treatment uh, no more. So in my opinion, it's useful, but not, not always uh, possible, accepted. Okay, thank you, Horace. Um, there's a question from Suryadi Suwandinata, and um, it, it's uh, about um, deep endometriosis uh, surgery and uh, its impact on fertility. Um, maybe you can have a short answer on that difficult question. 
this is a difficult question and uh, this is the is another favorite topics uh, of me because i think that the surgery is a treatment of the infertility in women with endometriosis so i routinely propose the surgery uh, to patients who have uh, an infertility and uh, deep endometriosis because uh, as i showed in the in the slide with the endorandomized trial, after the first line surgery, you may expect up to 80% of uh, pregnancies within four years, and the majority of them are natural pregnancies. So, uh, I, I need strong arguments to refer a patient with deep endometriosis directly to IVF without surgery. So the surgery for me is a very, very good option in patients with uh, infertility, uh, more or less uh, painful, because we give them a chance of, uh, of uh, natural pregnancy. And in endorandomized trial, 75% of infertile women who had surgery were pregnant, and the majority of them were pregnant naturally. Okay, there's another question from Amit Kyle, and um, he would like to know what is your uh, fistula management if it occurs. And I would like to add, um, what is your follow-up uh, procedure? Uh, how do you get notice of maybe a fistula? Uh, do you measure CRP levels? And, and what is the management if it happens? Our management is very standardized, and you you can you can uh, have a look at uh, the paper um, published in Human Reproduction because we paid the open access, so it, it's available for everybody. So all the patients who had a colorectal surgery, disc excision or colorectal resection, they leave the hospital at day three, and they have uh, monitoring of the white cell and CRP for at least one week. And the CRP should continuously decrease. And if you have an increase of the CRP, the patient is prevented, she has to call the hospital and she has to take the luggage and to come back to the hospital. And um, when the patients arrive to the hospital, we perform, immediately we perform a scan, abdominal scan. And if the scan, even though the scan is not, is almost normal, we perform a laparoscopy. And we carry out a, a bubble test and we, in, we inject a blue liquid into the rectum in order to check if we have or not a small fistula. And not uh, earlier than uh, yesterday, I, um, I received the patients with a disc excision last week. And uh, she come back with uh, CRP protein at 290, 290, and the day before it was 22. So this patient had scan and surgery. We found only a big abscess around the disc excision. No abnormal bubble test. However, we performed a stoma because we, we suspected that we have a microfistula. So if, if you do not perform the stoma in all the patients with, uh, in, in a majority of patients, we should be very fast in the, in the management of any, any biological symptoms. So we, we, we never have patients with peritonitis because we perform the management before the peritonitis. So increasing the CRP uh, over 100 means that uh, you have either an abscess or a fistula and you have to, to, to schedule uh, the day, uh, the same day we have to do a um, surgery. Thank you, Horace. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you very well. Okay, perfect. Um, there's another question regarding the pre-surgical management. What is the moment that you know uh, what type of surgery on the rectum you're going to do? Uh, already when you do ultrasound or it's uh, intraoperative? Mm. 
in, uh, in th there is another, another article published two years ago in the uh, Journal of Manumary Invasive Gynecology, where I show that in 80% of cases, we performed the technique which was planned at the consultation, preoperative consultation, because all the patients have uh, MRI. Some of them also have an ultrasound. Me, I'm not doing ultrasound, so I'm not at ease with ultrasound, but I read very well the MRIs. So all my patients have an MRI. And from while to while, we carry out a CT scan to identify uh, lesions on the, on the sigmoid colon or the cecum. And uh, in some cases, we perform uh, the endorect ultrasound. But with all this data, I have a good idea uh, preoperatively what kind of technique I will uh, carry out. And in 80% of cases, I do the technique which was planned. So I need to know the length of the infiltration. There are se several, so you have to, to read the, this article because it's very detailed. So the depth, the length, uh, the height, it is uh, important to see because uh, uh, each nod a nodule on the low rectum up to eight centimeters above the anus may be very large. We can do a disc excision using the wrong technique. If the nodule is up, is uh, upper than 10 centimeters, the technique, wrong technique is not feasible. So if the nodule is less than three centimeters, disc excision, it, it is larger, is a colorectal resection. Thank you. We still have some more questions. Uh, there is another question re regarding the cutoff level for CR protein. Um, is there a cutoff level or not? The question is from Tana Usta from Turkey. Yeah, uh, two years ago we published a paper in the British Journal, uh, British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, about the C-reactive protein. So we identified the threshold of 100 at day four. It means that if the day three you have 122 and the day four you have 80 or 70, it means that you're on the right path. Um, however, uh, C-reactive protein 100, the day four or day five, or as I told you, um, C-reactive protein, which, which grows very much from a day to the day after, from 22 to 290, it means that you have either an abscess or a fistula. So 100 for me is the, is the threshold um, at uh, day four. Okay, um, I think uh, we can do one more question. There's one from Sunday Shkadi um, about the pre-surgical setting and um, uh, he, wish, he or she wishes to highlight why you use sometimes a CT scan. How does it add to your diagnosis? Yeah, so um, uh, thank you to my friend uh, Sunday. Um, so the CT scan, I, I was using frequently the CT scan when I was in Rouen because uh, I was having three radiologists very, very skilled in this uh, exam. And with the CT scan, um, I, uh, I was having very accurate information about the involvement of the cecum or the last uh, 20 centimeter of the ilio and also the upper sigmoid. And now, in Bordeaux, I'm carrying out less for two reasons. Because I do not have this guy with me. And second is that uh, the, 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 I improved my skill. So if during the surgery I find inadvertently a uh, sickle nodule, we are able to perform a resection, ileocolic resection in less than 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So it does not change too much the, the, the operative time. So you're not embarrassed to do a... So right now I, I reduced the use of the CT scan because it adds a new exam to, a, to patients who had a lot of exam before. 
and uh, actually it does not uh, help me uh, too much but intraoperatively i uh, routinely check very carefully all the sigmoid and uh, the last uh, 40 centimeter of the ileon and the cecum in order not to overlook the nodules that that uh, i would have seen in a ct scan okay horace um last question um um, what about your recommendation starting fertility treatment after disc excision or segmental resection? And what about uh, your recommendation about delivery modus, C-section or vaginal birth? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, if we carry out, uh, if, if the nodule also involved the vagina, so I ask to patient, usually ask to patient not having sexual intercourses for two to three uh, months and not having a speculum examination. So I, uh, if they are referred to the IVF, I uh, ask them to schedule the IVF three months after the surgery. Um, as regards the, um, the delivery, um, the excision of the vagina is not a problem. I ask, I ask to, I recommend to obstetricians to check the elasticity of the vagina at the end of the, um, uh, of the pregnancy. And if they feel that the vagina is supple, is soft enough, they can deliver vaginally. That is different for the rectal suture. If the rectal suture involves the low rectum or the mid rectum, uh, I recommend, or the general surgeon asked me to recommend, a uh, cesarean section. Because any injury of the anal sphincter uh, may uh, be very harmful for the bowel movement and for the anal continence after the surgery. Because maybe after the surgery of the low rectum or mid rectum, if the patient is continent, maybe the the balance is very fragile. So adding a new factor of incontinence may uh, completely change the, the situation. And I have a patient like this with a Ruon technique who delivered vaginally against our advice. And she had uh, anal incontinence for two years after the delivery because she had uh, instrumental delivery with a large episiotomy and maybe uh, uh, injury of the anal sphincter. So I think that in the surgery of, uh, when the patient had a surgery of low and mid rectum, the cesarean section is a, is a good choice. Okay, Horace, thank you so much. Many, many thanks for your brilliant presentation. It was really nice to discuss all the questions of the participants. Thanks to all our colleagues around the world. Uh, attending to our webinar tonight. There are still some questions, but maybe we can discuss them next time. Thanks to you, Horace. I may um, um, just notice that uh, on um, November 17th, uh, we have another webinar with Shaheen Kazali from London, and he's going to talk about the management of ureteral endometriosis. And um, Good night to everybody now. Stay healthy and thanks again to you, Horace. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye.